what I want to do today is, is pick at this little saying that you oftentimes hear around Christian people. Um, and, and the saying is that God makes us new, or sometimes Jesus makes us new or, or we're renewed. I, I think it's a great saying. I don't want to pick at it in the sense that I'd, I'd want to de- deconstruct it. What I want to do is examine it. Um, because I think it's so good, we often miss the full weight of what's being communicated. And, and so what I want to do is look at the nativity story and look at three groups of people that are made new by their encounters with Christ. And then I want to look at how you and I are made new in, in our encounters with Jesus Christ. And, and then because this whole month we're talking about the things that God does for us and how he wants us to do those things for others, I, I want to talk about how you and I can, can help others be renewed uh, because of Jesus. So, so that's kind of the roadmap for where we're going today. So, so real quick, let me refresh you, refresh your memory about, about the nativity story. You, you just saw the Star Wars crawl that kind of gives you the beats. But, but you know that the, the original nativity story, the story of the birth of Jesus, um, is, is, is a crazy story about an unwed teenage girl uh, who has to run from religious and political persecution in a very tense time in human history. Um, and, and when her child is born, it's not just any baby. I mean, the, the bedrock of the Christian story is that the, the birth of Jesus signals the time when God sort of left heaven and came here to live among us as one of us. And the story of Jesus begins in this sort of scandalous time and place in these scandalous circumstances. And, and, and one of the people that, that were most positively impacted by the coming of Christ are, are the group of shepherds. Now, the best analogy we have for shepherds in our contemporary context are blue-collar workers who work seven days a week, 15 hours a day, I mean, who just slave over and over and over and over again and, and feel like they're not getting anywhere feel like they have no hope to get ahead, feel like they have no way to change their circumstances. They're the, the, the functional working poor. And that's really who the shepherds represent. And the story of the shepherds during the nativity is that they're, they're out watching their fields by night, and a chorus of angels appears to them and announces the birth of a Savior. Now, this is significant because when they hear about a Savior, what do you think they need saving from? They're not thinking about their souls being saved. Their their concerns aren't with heaven. Their concerns are with how much it sucks to be a shepherd. So when they hear the good news of the gospel of God, what what they're being told is that there's a change coming. Not not only a change in their working conditions, but more importantly, a change in how they feel, in in their identity, in their connection between what they do and who they are, and, and the significance that goes along with that. And so as they follow... And go and find the Christ child, what they get back is a sense of dignity. Instead of feeling like they're being ground down, like they're, they don't count, like they're not worth anything, when they meet the Christ child, they're reintroduced to an old story about the greatest king in their tradition, who himself, King David, began as a shepherd. And when they meet this little baby, they're told that this little baby is a king like David. And when they start making those connections between themselves as shepherds and a great king who was a shepherd and a little baby who's going to be a great king like that shepherd king, their whole reality has changed. And maybe that's difficult for you and I to understand, but try and see it through the lens of their perspective. That what felt like defeat, what felt like doom and despair, what felt like it didn't matter, now all of a sudden matters a great deal. And the worst job has now been elevated to a noble and kingly profession. They get, in a word, hope. Now, the second group of people that are positively affected by the coming of Christ are the magi or the wise men. Now, there's all kinds of stuff that we could talk about with the wise men, but the most important thing to recognize here is that these are, of course, not Christians, because there were no Christians yet, but these are neither Christians nor Jews. When the wise men come from the east, they come as practitioners of another religion. So if you wanted to pick a contemporary parallel, you've got to imagine that the wise men are like Muslim imams, Hindu priests, um, Buddhist holy men. They are people of another religion entirely. And they come because they 
see something in the stars as astrologers. They, they know that something spectacular is happening in the world. So they come and they, they visit the Christ child and everything for them changes. They begin to see holes in their religions. They begin to see flaws in their former ways of thinking. They, they begin to recognize that what they had previously held to be true must now be called into question. If the shepherds are given new hope, the magi are given a new truth. Now, the third group of people that are changed by the coming of Christ are the people we might sort of clump together and refer to as the faithful. And that includes the Holy Family, you know, Mary and Joseph. Mary certainly was changed by the birth of Jesus because now she had a baby. But also Simeon and Anna, two elderly people who worked in the temple. And, and these are people who now, confronted with Jesus, realize they have new responsibilities. I mean, if you've ever gone from not being a mom to being a mom, you know there's a lot of new responsibilities. If you've ever gone from not being a dad to now being responsible for a child, especially a child that might not be yours, you, you know there's a lot of new responsibilities. If you've been waiting your whole life, as Simeon and Anna had, for some long-anticipated child to arrive, and it does, then you realize now everything is different. So for the shepherds, there's hope. For the magi, there's a new truth. For the holy family and, and the temple servants, now, now there's a new set of responsibilities. For all three of these people, these groups of people, history has changed. I feel like it's time to wake up and go to the gym. That's okay. So for all three of these people, there's a moment up to the coming of Christ and then everything after the coming of Christ. It's, it's a pivot for them in history. Now, you and I know what these pivots are like. I mean, like you, you, if you've ever gotten married, you know there's kind of your before married life and now there's your married life. If you've sadly ever gone through a divorce, you know that there was like, there was life before the divorce and then life after. The, the reality is just different. Well, Jesus likens his coming to that kind of reality-changing event. But he says it's even greater or more significant than that. So he gives it the term that it's like you've been born again. Like your life has started over now. Now, of course, back then when he said the term born again, nobody thought it made any sense. In fact, they asked him, they're like, born again, do you really mean to suggest that we're supposed to crawl back inside our mothers? And you can just see Jesus going like, no, <laughs> no, it's a metaphor. He's saying you've got to be born of the Spirit, meaning from now on, it's like your life has started over again. You've been, it's like you've been made new. Now, all throughout the Bible, that word new has got huge significance. There's a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation, a new spirit, a new heart, a new mind. There's new people, a new ethnicity. It's new, 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 new. Always God is doing something new in and among his people. The word for new, in, in the Greek language at least, is the word naos, and it means, this is so cool, don't miss this, belonging to the present. When God makes us new, he gives us this time, right now, unhinged and unfettered by the past. Now, if you're like most of us, you've got all this stuff from before. You know, you felt ashamed of what you did before, either because you did some bad stuff or because other people made you feel bad when maybe you shouldn't have, but you got some bad stuff over there that you feel bad about. You, you, you've, you've got some, some old hiccups, some old baggage, some old relationships, some, some old patterns and, and habits of ways of being, all this old, 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 and it, and it keeps you stuck. But when Jesus makes us new, when encountering God gives us new life, what that means is now you belong to just this second. That as of right now, there's nothing holding you back. There is nothing keeping you shackled to the past, to addiction, to shame, to frustration, to futility, nothing. You've been made New in Jesus. And if, if you dig a little deeper, you find that not only is new always contrasted with old, but the best definition of new means something surprising, unanticipated, something unlooked for that bursts into being. That, that's what God is doing in you. He's making all things New. And, and, and I think we really need to be reminded of that. 
him. Now, of course, in the ancient world, there was a, a whole sea of other religions, a plethora, which is a word. What was the movie where they made the word plethora famous? Was it Three Amigos? Was it really? Does nobody else watch movies? Are you so spellbound by the sermon that you can't remember? But a plethora, anyway, a plethora of other religions. And, and, and one of these other religions was the, the, the worshipers of the new moon. And they were the kind of the other big group that used this word new over and over and over again. And they believed that you were spiritually renewed, you know, every 28 days, whatever, whatever, there was a new moon. Well, in contrast to this sort of very limited seasonal thinking, the church kept saying, no, 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 you, you're, you're not renewed by the new moon. You're not renewed by seasons. You're not renewed by summertime. You're not renewed by springtime. You're renewed by Jesus right now. And, and forever again. And so they likened it, actually, in, in some of their, what we call non-canonical literature, you know, the, the stuff the Christians were reading that wasn't in the Bible. They, they likened it to being a, as a butterfly. And the transformation that happens when you go from caterpillar to butterfly. Anybody grow up in church and sing that song, Bullfrogs and Butterflies? I sang it for the 830 crowd, but I'm not singing it for you. Because we, <laughs> we sang Happy Birthday already, and I'm tapped out for song, Right? But the whole idea was that there, there's these two species in nature, bullfrogs and, and butterflies, that go through a, a metamorphosis. Now, the way that a caterpillar lives is, of course, totally different than the way a butterfly lives. A caterpillar is basically a fancy worm that crawls around in the dirt. But, but a butterfly can't, can't live like that. It can't crawl around. It's got to spread its wings. It's got to fly. It's got to be beautiful. It's got to be appreciated. It's got to be free. It's got to soar. And, and so Christian people used to contrast who we used to be as old people to who we are now in Christ Jesus as new people as the difference between caterpillars and butterflies. And there's a totally different way to live. Consequently, when you go to the Bible and you read, like, there's big lists of, of do's and don'ts. Like, we're going to read one here in a moment from the book of Galatians. And it'll say stuff like, in your old nature or in your sinful nature, you used to do these things. But now in your new nature, renewed by the Holy Spirit, you do these things. When you see those lists, I want you to interpret them as the difference between who you used to be and who you are. Between who you were when you belonged to the past and who you are now that you belong to this present moment in Christ Jesus. And the reason I'm trying to give you that instruction before we read the scripture is because too often when we read these lists of, you know, don't do that and instead do these things, we use them to judge others. We sit there and we go, oh, it talks about lust. Well, you know who's lustful? That guy over there sinner. And no, that, that's not how the Bible is meant to be used. It's meant for me to look at me and go, wait a minute, am I living like a caterpillar or am I living like a new creation? Do I belong to this present moment? And if so, how? So here we go. Galatians 5, chapter 16, or chapter 5, verse, verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Or or your old nature. Now the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. And these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. Now when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. But let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. We'll come back to that phrase in a second. But instead, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, there's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified him with it. Since we are living with the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Now, again, what I want to suggest is that this is the way that we can tell the difference between the way we used to live and the way we're called to live now. Between the way we live when we belong to our old nature and the way we live in our new nature. 
So, so consequently, we're always going back to the, this passage of Scripture or passages of Scripture like that and asking ourselves, all right, am I living with love? Am I increasing my ability to demonstrate patience? Am I more gentle than I was before? Am I more kind than I was before? Or am I completely absent of self-control, running around, doing all kinds of stuff that I know I need not be doing? And, and that's the way we go back and forth between trying to figure out, am I living like a caterpillar or am I living like a butterfly? Do I belong to the past or do I belong to the present? And over and over and over again, what we want to do is, is invite the Holy Spirit to check us about how we're living and how we're going to be changed increasingly. Now, here, of course, is the big issue, right? Where does the energy for transformation come from? Let me give you a hint. It's not actually writing down all the rules and then trying to follow them. So if you write down even this piece of the Bible, which, of course, is very useful and very helpful and very clear, if you write down, things I will not do today, lustfully party, <laughs> You might even successfully keep all the list of rules that you make for yourself, but it's not going to produce any internal transformation. The thing that produces transformation is connection to Jesus. The thing that transformed the shepherds was an encounter with God, not a bunch of rules about how to be hopeful shepherds. The thing that transformed the Magi was an encounter with God, not a bunch of rules about why Judaism or Christianity or whatever was right and, and Zoroastrianism or whatever it is was wrong. The thing that transformed the Holy Family into, into embracing and grabbing hold of all that God intended for them was not a list of rules about how to be a great parent to God. Rules have no power to change you. If you want to change, what you got to do is get connected more deeply with Jesus. To give yourself over whole, because he's the one who makes you new. He's the one who's already made you new. And he's waiting for us to embrace that and press into it. Now, it's, it's hard. It doesn't come without struggle. But, but the point is that, that that's where we put all our energy. Now, I told you that what I wanted to do was just explore briefly some people who were made new in the nativity story. Shepherds, magi, faithful. And, and then talk specifically about how you and I are being made new and, and what that process is like. That's what that piece of Galatians is. But I also want to tell you a story about how we might make others new and how we might help others experience the newness that comes through Jesus. When I was in high school, we used to run this um, bus ministry at our church. We bought a, an old school bus, painted it gray, and we used to go out into into some rough neighborhoods on Saturday mornings and invite any of the kids from these neighborhoods to climb up on the, the gray church school bus and come to the church. And we'd put on like a big kids program for them and would give, you know, free babysitting and fun meals and play games and do all this stuff, you know, from about 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning till, till lunchtime. And then we'd take them back home. And we did this for a couple years. And uh, there was a fella named Kyle who lived in one of these communities. And he started watching us, which anytime you do something with children, if there's an adult male that starts watching you, you, you get a little nervous, right? Like, is, is he worried that I'm a threat? Is he a threat to them? Is he a threat to us? I mean, you, just, you, get, you get a little touchy. So, so this guy watched us for two to three weeks, and we were kind of getting our spider sense tingling. Um, and, then, and then he asked if he could be involved. And we did a criminal background check and found out that he'd, he'd recently got out of prison. And so there again, there's kind of a little red flag there where you go, I probably don't want somebody right out of prison directly involved with children. You don't want to keep some appropriate boundaries there just in case. Um, but he kept coming around and he said, look, I, I want to get involved in what you're doing. Can I fix the bus? Well, sure, you can change the oil, check the tires, whatever. Sure, go for it. Hey, listen, I really want to do more than what I'm doing right now. Can I at least accompany you? as you walk through the neighborhood, home to home to home, so that I can keep you safe or watch out for you. And by this time, we'd, we'd been talking to Kyle for a while. So, so okay, sure, we, we got a little bit of trust with you. And over and over and over again, and then Kyle said, can I ride on the bus? And again, because trust had been established over and over again, and we had some protections in place, we said, yeah. And finally, one day, I said to Kyle, I was like, well, why are you so interested in, in what we're doing? And he said, I grew up in this neighborhood, and I see what you're doing for these kids. And nobody ever did that for me. And I think my life would have been different if I'd had somebody like you. 
And more than that, I see how much you love these kids. And those kids experience that love. And I want to be somebody who can love like that. And I, I don't think I am yet. And I see how happy it makes you to be hanging out with them, to do what you're doing on a Saturday and put all the games and all the fun and all that good. And I, I want that happiness. Is that okay? Well, no, Kyle, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, is that okay? Well, the truth is, in, in that moment, you know, is, is Kyle and I had a long conversation about what it means to be born again, about what it means to start over, to belong to this moment with God. And I want you to think about the small miracle it is that we ever got there with Kyle. I mean, just it was kind of a fluke that we were in his neighborhood. It was kind of a fluke that we ever let him anywhere near us because, again, there were all kinds of things that would have normally kept our, our arm's length away from the guy. But over time, using discernment with protections in place, we built a relationship with somebody, and we were able to do for him what the Lord had done for us, which is help him encounter God in a way that he was born again, that he started over, that he was made new. And that story has a happy continuance for Kyle and a happy ending for Kyle as he continues to love and serve and follow Jesus. But that's just a small example of what it's like when we invite other people into seeing what God does, when we are made new and we help others encounter God so he makes them new as well. But this whole Christmas season, this is what we want our church to be doing. Is we want you to appreciate what God is doing for you and offer that to other people. That, that's why we pass out Christmas tickets so you can bring people to Christmas Eve. That, that's why we're inviting everybody to participate in random acts of Christmas is so that you can pay it forward. That, because over and over and over again, following Jesus isn't just about getting from him. It's about experiencing him and inviting others to experience him also. L -l Let's pray. Jesus, thanks very much um, for all the ways in which you've renewed us in which you've rejuvenated us, given a chance to start over, given us a chance to break free from our old lives, our old patterns, our behavior, our old, our old dumbness and stupidity, and, and we thank you for that. We, we want to live differently because of you. So we pray, Lord, that in a million little ways today that you would remind us what it means to live faithfully, to live cooperatively with you, and to offer other people the ability to know you like we do. We pray these things, God, in your name. Amen.